Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated this morning. Uh, I love I love this passage of scripture in Numbers chapter 13 because God is going to declare over the people, I'm bringing you out of Egypt. Come on, I don't know if there's anybody in the room who can uh, remember what your Egypt was defined by. Oh, I, I, you can't be saved for so long that you don't remember what your Egypt was like. The thing that had you bound, the thing that enslaved you. Maybe you were enslaved in a negative relationship or an abusive relationship. Maybe you were enslaved in confusion. Come on. Anybody can realize, anybody can testify, God didn't save me from drugs. God didn't save me from alcohol. God really saved me from my stupid self. Come on. Anybody in the room? Anybody? Oh, God, you saved me from me. You saved me from my own stupidity. Everybody's got an Egypt, and God declares, I am the God that can get you out. I can rescue you. I can deliver you. If you are trapped in confusion right now, I can take you out. If you're trapped in a negative relationship right now, baby, I can get you out. This is a God who proves that I can get you out. I'll take you through the Red Sea. I'll get you out of Egypt. Pharaoh wants to treat you like a slave, but I look at you and I say, you're a son. You're a daughter. Your value is of infinite worth. This is a God that says, I'll take you out. But how many people know that I can't get excited about a God who can take me out if this ain't a God who can also take me in to my promise. And so often what happens in the church is we have people who have been taken out of captivity, taken out of confusion, taken out of a life of sin, taken out of darkness, but we're stuck in the middle because we have not yet walked into the thing that God has into our future. And so we are frustrated because we are no longer in what God took us out of, but we are not yet in the thing that God wants to take us into. And this is not just a God that takes us out of things. This is a God that puts us into things. This is why you can't stop reading at the book of Exodus. You've got to get into numbers. You've got to get into Joshua. And I love the fact that our pastor has declared that this is the year of Canaan because this is not a God who takes us out without a place prepared for us. I made Canaan before I freed you. I prepared Canaan before I freed you. Oh yes, if you open up the book of Genesis, you will realize that this is the God that makes the sky before he makes the birds. Yeah, this is the God that makes the sea before he makes the sea creatures. Oh, this is the God who makes the dry land before he makes the animals because God will always form something before he fills something and God is working in your life and you may not be able to discern what he's doing but this is the God who's preparing things behind the scenes for you and if we're gonna walk not just out of sin and out of darkness but into the glorious future that God has for us then we have to understand that there are going to be giants in the land Oh, the enemy's not going to let you leave him homeless. Oh, the enemy is occupying the space that God has already prepared for you. And so many of us, we want to enjoy the fruit, but we don't want to endure the fight. We want to enjoy the fruit, but we, won't, we don't want to endure the fight. I, I was in... Um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, a couple of months ago. I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. If you've never been to Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, you don't need to. Not a place I'm in a rush to go back to, but I was preaching uh, in, in New Mexico, and, and, and I said I had one requirement. I had one requirement. I said, if I'm going to come to Albuquerque, New Mexico, there's a TV show that I love. The TV show was filmed in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, if, you, if I got, I got to go to all of the spots where the TV show was filmed. I don't care what you pay me. I don't care. And, and Sam, who travels with me, is like, no, we care. <laughs> uh, and the show is called Breaking Bad. I know any Breaking Bad fans in the room, anybody who's ever watched the show Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad was filmed in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so I had a list, Pastor Freed. I had a list. I was like, I'm going to go eat at Los Pollos Hermanos. <laughs> you hear that Cuban coming out of me, you know? I, I, I knew exactly where I was going to go. I was like, I'm going to go to the car wash that Walter White bought. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm going to go to all of these landmarks. And in the place, the pinnacle of the landmark, the number one landmark that I wanted to get to was Walter White's house. There's a famous home, and the home receives over 400 tourists a week. People who are obsessed with the show Breaking Bad who visit Albuquerque for the sole purpose of going to all of the sites from the show and who want to go to Walter White's house. And so, of course, I make my host. I was like, I know we got to preach, but you're going to take me to Walter White's house. We go to Walter White's house. 
And Walter White's house doesn't look the way that I remembered it looking on the show. For, for starters, Walter White's house on the TV show did not have a gate, a fence. It did not look like a military fortress on the show. But the owners have now installed this electric gate around the perimeter of the property. Uh, not only was there no fence, no gate on the TV show, but there was no sign declaring, take your pictures from across the street. <laughs> Big, huge sign up on the gate. Uh, um, and, and the other thing that was different from the show versus the reality when I went to Albuquerque is there was no grumpy old couple sitting on their front lawn yelling at all the tourists that came by. So we circled around the cul-de-sac and got in line. There were about four or five cars that were there before us because, I mean, they average 400 tourists a week. Whenever you go there, all you see is tourists and four or five cars are in front of me. We wait our turn and through the windshield, through the window of the car, I can hear the woman from the house yelling and screaming, why are you here? We don't want you here. Why are you here? I mean, she's yelling. We finally get out the car, because I mean, it's okay. I, you ain't gonna scare me. I came here to come to Walter White's house, and I'm on a mission. We get out the car, we're taking our pictures from across the street, which is what the sign is saying, and this woman, I kid you not, starts yelling, you're on my neighbor's rocks. <laughs> well, ma'am, they are rocks. <laughs> Last thing I uh, discovered, rocks were not fragile. You know, she's yelling and screaming. As we got into the car, all I realized was one thing, that she could have started a business with all of the tourists that visit her house every single week. What she saw as a burden, I saw as a blessing. <laughs> What she saw as an annoyance, I saw as an opportunity. What she saw as something that she wanted to throw away is something I would have invited. So this woman is barking at her potential blessing because she does not recognize, she does not have the discernment to see, I could charge $20 here, $20 there, $20. I will have a Walter White wall. You can take pictures in front. If you're getting 400 tours a week, you better turn that house into a museum and buy another house and another another part of town. Why are you bitter when you could be blessed? And we're never going to enter Canaan as long as we think that Canaan is not going to be a burden. But baby, if you don't want to fight giants, you're never going to get to Canaan. You've got to have the discernment to see you're not a giant. You're just in my way. You're not a giant. You're here to make me stronger. I've got to see the opportunity and all of the things that annoy me. And if you're going to walk into Canaan, then you're going to have to have the eyes to see every opportunity. You're going to have to seize the day. You're going to have to seize the control of your eyes because a spouse could be walking towards you. And you are too frustrated by the burden that you cannot see the blessing. And you know that God wraps blessing in the gift wrap paper of burden. God doesn't put things in your hand. He places things in your reach. And this is the God that says, if you're going to be blessed, it's because you're going to have to walk in it. If you're going to be blessed, it's because you're going to have to have discernment to see it. If you're going to be blessed, I'm not going to gift wrap this for you. I'm not going to send it to your house. If you really want blessing, you're going to have to wake up and grab it. If you really want blessing, you're going to have to recognize it when it's in front of your face. If you really want blessing, you're going to have to turn burdens into blessings. You're going to have to turn something that's annoying into an opportunity. And so I've got seven steps towards Canaan. This is my first time preaching seven steps, Pastor Al. I'm trying to be like Pastor Andy today. Pastor Andy's always got seven steps. I got seven steps, and we're going to get through all these seven steps. We're going to get through all of them, praise God. I've never done seven steps. We're going to do seven steps today. Praise Jesus. First step. First step. Giants cannot shock you. If you're taking notes, write that down. Number one, giants cannot shock you. 
I don't know if you've ever been shocked by somebody. I don't know if everybody, anybody, this is my wife does this to me. We're, we're, we can act like children sometimes. My wife will be hiding, and my wife will jump out from around a corner, and my wife, my wife will startle me, or she'll shock me, or she'll surprise me, and I got to get this. I got to help you out because sometimes shock can feel like fear. And I want to help you because you're not scared. You just got shocked. And sometimes when you realize my wife, she peeked around a corner and she surprised me, I want to help you because in that moment, what I felt was fear, but I'm not really afraid, I'm just surprised. And I want to declare over you today that if you're going to walk into Canaan, the enemy's job is to make you so paralyzed by fear that you won't move to kill the giant in your life. And the way that the enemy traps you in fear is to shock and surprise you. But on the second Sunday, in the second Sunday of February, a short youth pastor that's a originally from Boston, Massachusetts, was preaching at World Overcomers and reminded you when you go to the doctor's office and they give you a negative report, you cannot be surprised because did you think the enemy was just going to let you walk into Canaan easily? When you go to your school to pick up your kid and they have a negative report about your son or about your daughter, don't you be surprised when you get shocked by the enemy. The enemy can make you feel as if you are in fear, but there's a big difference between being shocked and being scared just because I'm shocked does not mean I'm scared I'm not afraid of my wife she just caught me off guard and you know that the enemy can catch you off guard and make you believe that you're scared and I want to help you today because if you're gonna walk into Canaan there will be giants and they cannot shock you and if the moment you feel shocked this is why you need to lift your hands and worship to remind your spirit I'm no longer a slave to fear but I am a child of God I'm gonna walk in everything that God has for me he split the seat so that I can walk right through it I remind my soul you may be caught off guard but baby I will have the last laugh the enemy may have thrown the first punch but we better believe that my God God is for me and my God is with me and nothing if my God is with me no one can be against me number two not only can giants not shock you but you have to realize that the giants are Nephilim number two if you're taking notes the giants are Nephilim I don't know if you've ever read Genesis chapter 6 but in Genesis chapter 6 what happens is that angels fallen angels have sex with women and create a giant species of people called the Nephilim the Bible's better than TMZ <laughs> Bible's entertaining. I don't know who told you the Bible's boring, but they wrong. The Bible is entertaining. So the Bible declares in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 you can read it in your spare time that that there are fallen angels that somehow copulate with women and they have a giant race of humans called the Nephilim. They are giants. And what Numbers chapter 13 reminds us of is that the giants that were in Canaan were the descendants of Anak who were the descendants of Nephilim. Because giants are a spiritual issue with a physical manifestation. A giant is not just what you can see with your natural eye, but a giant is an invisible force with a visible power. Oh yeah, anxiety is a giant because wrapped up in a physical manifestation is an invisible source that you may not be able to see. Depression is a giant. You're trying to diagnose it with medication, but medication cannot cure a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual thing with a physical manifestation. And if you're ever going to win in the battle for Canaan, then you you are going to have to realize that the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and high places. And the more I fight on a spiritual level, I've got to fight on a physical level and a spiritual level. See, you've been arguing with people at your job that you should just be laying hands on. What you need to do is go to the bathroom and start praying. What you need to do is sit in your cubicle and intercede. What you need to do is get wake up a couple minutes early and start to rebuke some things off of your life because the more we get angry and the more we get frustrated and the more we spin our wheels, what we realize is that the battle is not physical. The battle is spiritual with physical implications. The giants that you're facing are never just what your eyes can see. I want you to ask yourself this question. What giant am I facing that is hiding its invisible source? Oh, Jesus. 
Because the enemy wants to distract you with the physical so that you will not fight the spiritual. Can my wife come up here? Come on, babe. Come on up here. Which, with your white boots, okay. And your curly hair. Oh, I love you. Here's what the enemy does. Here's what the enemy does. This is for all the married people. The enemy will get you so distracted fighting one another. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you did that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, you, uh, uh, you, you disrespected me. You did that. You did. And, and the, what the enemy does is he'll get you so tired from fighting each other that you have no energy to fight him. <sighs> because you cannot fight two battles at the same time. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants to distract you with a physical thing that is bothering you so much so that you drop the sword of the spirit and you stop fighting spiritually. But if you got discernment, if you're married in this room and you're going to walk in Canaan with your spouse, then what you need to do is you need to get back to back and realize, baby, I got your back. Oh, there's giants fighting you. There's giants fighting me too. We got this. We're a team. I'm on your side. You're on my side. Oh, you got school loans? That means those are my school loans. And if we're going to fight giants, then me, we got to fight giants together. Amen. I love you, Tia. Here's what happens, though. Here's what the enemy can do. He'll make you feel like, oh, that's my husband's giant. That's my wife's giant. Let me help you. <laughs> when you got married, you signed up for this thing called oneness. It's called unity, <laughs> which means her debt is your debt, which means her giant is your giant, which means his giant is your giant, which means his medical issue is your medical issue, which means her financial issue is your financial issue. And you can, you can spend your time fighting with the person or you can turn your backs to one another and you can start fighting the giant that is trying to take you out. You can realize we are going to get to Canaan and we're going to get to Canaan together and we can get through this thing. One can put a thousand of flight and two can put 10,000 of flight. Baby, we get exponential power when we agree with one another. We are not going to argue we're not gonna bicker we're not gonna fight we're gonna put our differences aside and unite so that we can get to where God wants us to go come on give God a big huge shot of praise all over the room all right I think I'm on number three is this is number three Amanda this is number three number three you write this down I'm waiting for it to pop up on the screen so I don't have to look at my notes fear is fueled by others Fear is fueled by others. Um, conservative estimations will say that somewhere between 500,000 to 800,000 Israelites got freed out of Egypt. Non-conservative estimates say there could have been anywhere from two to three million Israelites that got freed out of Egypt. Doesn't matter which number you go with, a lot of people got freed out of Egypt, but 10 people convinced hundreds of thousands of people to be scared of giants. Moses sent 12 men to spy the land. Joshua and Caleb came back with a positive report, and 10 people were able to convince an entire nation that they should be gripped by fear. If you are gonna walk in Canaan, you're gonna have to mute yourself to every single person. Your ears are gonna have to be circumcised to hear God and God alone. Because your uncle that don't believe in tithing, oh, oh, oh Jesus. Have you ever realized it takes one person who don't believe in something to knock you off of the mountain of faith that it has taken you all year to climb up. And there are some people in this room, it took you all of 2018 just to have the faith to give God 10% of your income. And now you, and you're glad about it. You told your family and they're like, I don't know why you're doing that. And now the whole car ride home, you're thinking to yourself, you know what, it is stupid. Oh, see, we're quiet because it's real. Quiet because it's real. You cannot tell all your single friends about your marriage plans. 
Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. We're going to step on some toes today. We're going to step on some toes. It's going to be okay. Just, just don't, don't wear open toe shoes to church. We're going to step on some toes. Um, because some of your friends, some of your day ones, some of the people you've been riding with, some of your ride or die people, some of the people that are in your crew, when you start talking about Canaan, they're scared you're going to leave them in the wilderness. And your single friends don't want you to leave them in the single wilderness. They want your weekends to be free so that you can play video games and waste time with them. Oh, yeah, all your single dude friends, you don't hang out with us no more. Yeah, I don't. You're right. Because I'm married. <laughs> I don't spend time. See, it gets quiet. It gets quiet. See, all your friends that are comfortable with their job, once you start talking about your business, they don't have anything to add. And fear is fueled by others, which means you're going to have to keep your dream to yourself and find some people who are big enough to actually add value to the thing that you're believing God for. You want to buy a home this year? You better meet some homeowners. You want to get married this year? You better start hanging around with some married people. What do you want to accomplish this year? Because if you're going to accomplish anything, you need a Caleb in your life. You need a Joshua in your life. You need somebody that says, oh, yeah, baby, I've been there. I've been through that. Yep, we had that same argument. We made it through. Oh, baby, don't. You better not. Uh, uh, you scared. What, what are you scared of? I'm on the other side. See, I don't trust anybody who has seen giants but didn't kill giants. And we allow people who have seen giants to have authority over, over our experience. And my only question is, wait, you saw a giant? Yeah, yeah, I saw a giant. They're huge. You should be scared. Oh, you, you saw a giant, you saw a giant. Okay, you saw a giant. What did you do though? Because as our pastor says, I'm not going to take swimming lessons from drowning people. If you saw one, but you did not kill one, then you can't say nothing to me. I don't need your help. You've been divorced two times. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. Number four, are we on number four, Pastor Al? We're on number four? Number four, I'm doing the seven point thing for the first time. This is like preaching to adults. I feel grown. I got seven points, you know what I'm saying? Come on, number four, number four. Giants are more afraid of you than you are of them. Giants are more afraid of you than you are of them. When you fast forward, that whole generation has to die. The generation that those 10 spies that they corrupted, that whole generation has to die. And, and, the next generation goes into the promised land. Uh, this is interesting because the generation that is freed from slavery cannot shift their mentality to become sons and not slaves. See, slaves are always wanting to be provided for. Sons understand how to provide for themselves. And so the generation that is born in the wilderness is born in freedom, and they have the confidence to take the land. See, so many times we have slave mentality that keeps us dependent upon our jobs. And the moment someone starts saying something like, you need to own your own business, see, that scares you because you don't know, you can't predict where your income is going to come from. But if you're going to get into Canaan, you can't be so dependent on a job that you can't provide wealth for yourself. Ooh, we preaching heavy today. It's okay, though. When the next generation finally gets into the land, Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. That the Canaanites were afraid of the Israelites. That the giants that were living, and it says that God made the fear of the Israelites spread through the whole land. That by the time they got to Canaan, the thing that was making them afraid was afraid of them. Do you know that the reason the enemy has attacked you with fear is because the enemy is really afraid of your potential. He's afraid of what you would do if you would realize who you were. He's afraid of a husband that wakes up in the morning and can pray for their family. He's afraid of a man who lifts up holy hands in church. And so the enemy makes you afraid. Oh, we got to get this. I, I don't want to preach this. I want to teach it. I really do. Because the enemy will make you afraid to worship. Jesus, I know this is spot on. Because you come to church every week and you are too cool 
to lift up your hands and to sing because at some level you believe the lie from the enemy that worship was feminine. And man, every man in this church, I promise you, that the enemy is making you afraid to worship because he's afraid of your worship. He's afraid of what would happen when men get together and men lift their hands and men declare, God, you're faithful and God, you're good. And I love you with all of my heart. See, and the, 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 the trick of the enemy is to feminize church. Because when the enemy wants to attack a culture, he attacks the men. When a, when a woman gets saved, there's a 30% chance that her children will also follow God. When a man gets saved, there's an 85% chance that his wife will get saved, that his children will get saved. Man, I'm telling you right now, if you're a husband in this room, if you're a soon-to-be husband in this room, if you are a young man in this church, we need you to worship. We don't send our women to war for us. We need you to stand on the front line and lift up your hands and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. The enemy is afraid of the voice that you've hidden. The enemy is afraid of your praise and your worship and you've been coming to church acting like you're too cool to praise God and you're afraid of being embarrassed and you're so self-conscious that you won't lay hold of the very thing that is the key to your freedom we are men we worship we lift up our hands a man's voice don't sound like a woman's voice for a reason demons tremble and flee when i open up my mouth i am a man take your god given rightful place as the man of your home the enemy is afraid of your voice and that is why he has muzzled you and muted you Jesus. Adam's sin is that he stood there silently while Eve was deceived by the serpent. Man, our current culture wants to teach us that the first sin of man is to abuse a woman. That's not true. The first sin of man was to not care enough to speak up. And so the enemy wants to attack our place as leaders and wants to feminize everything. But I promise you, a woman is not intimidated by you being a man. By you stop, put your video games away and step up to the plate and provide and be a man. Not to dictate and lord over her, but to lead her into everything that God has for you. We cannot take Canaan without men. Number five, number five, number five, number five. We got to get through all seven of these points. Number five, where we at? Big grapes mean big giants. We have a generation, this to all the millennials in the room. Here we go. We have a generation that wants to enjoy fruit without enduring the fight. Because we want to post everything on social media. You want to post all the grapes. Look what we doing. There are some things that God wants to do in your life that are not going to be Instagram worthy. Because we are so in love with the journey, we're so in love with the end that we have not fallen in love with the journey that it takes to get there. I'm sorry, you may not be a CEO boss at 26. See, it got quiet. It's going to take you interning for somebody. It's going to take you humbling yourself and learning some skills from somebody who's done it before you. And so many times we want to enjoy the fruit now. Give me fruit now. But if you go through Numbers chapter 13, they're only allowed to steal fruit one time. You can post it on Instagram today. But that's all you're going to get. It was funny. We were at a Bishop Jake's event. And... After we, in between the sessions, some people walked up to take selfies with him. It was a group of pastors. And at the end, we, you know, reconvened for the second session. And he said, it's so funny, your generation. He was talking to millennials. He was like, you wanted to come take a selfie with me. And because you wanted a selfie, a selfie is all you're going to get. Because you wanted all of the people who follow you on social media to think or to perceive you a certain way. 
because of the selfie you took with me when you could have asked me a question that could have changed your life. And we are so short-sighted that we want what looks good, not what is good. And sometimes the stuff that is good hurts. And the stuff that is good ain't sexy. And the stuff that is good happens in the dark. And we want to show off all of our fruits, but you can't show anybody your roots. Because roots happen underneath the surface of the soil. Roots happen when you get alone with God. Roots happen when you develop a private prayer life. Roots happen when you decide, I'm going to do my devotions every day. Roots happen when you decide, I'm going to kill giants, not just enjoy grapes. Which means, if we're going to enjoy grapes, because God does want us to enjoy grapes. He just wants us to be our grapes. He don't want us to enjoy least grapes. Oh, Jesus. I'd rather live in a small home that I own than have a big, huge apartment that everybody thinks is cool. See, see I'd rather have grapes that I own because the spies can only get grapes once. If you're going to enjoy grapes, you're going to have to endure the giant, which means, let, let me just, I stepped on all the men's toes, so now it's time for me to reverse. Because we taken the prayer cards off, but before every service, I flip over the cards and I just look at the prayer cards because I want to pray for our church. I want to know how to pray for you. And easily, 20% of the cards have this one word on the card, Boaz. I'm believing God for my Boaz. Now, here's the deal. I'm with you. That act, that's actually a good thing. We should want to be married. You believing God for a husband is a great thing. But here we go. You cannot enjoy the fruit of husband if you're not willing to kill the giant of attitude. And all the wives are going to say amen. See, see, this is why you got to stop talking to your single friends. <laughs> because your single friends do not have a proper understanding of reality. Because they've seen giants. And then, they, <laughs> but they didn't kill it. They didn't kill no, they don't got no rings on their fingers. And if you are going to enjoy the fruit of Canaan, you're going to have to, okay, okay. It, the same can be said of dudes. If you're going to enjoy the giant of a wife, you're going to have to kill. If you're going to enjoy the, the grapes of marriage, you're going to have to kill the giants of, hey, here we go, video games. See, it got real quick. See, dudes are like, oh. but that's how I wind down <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you're going to have to kill the giant of pornography if you're going to enjoy the grapes of marriage. See, there's some giants that you're going to have to kill in order to walk in the freedom and in the land and the promise and the Canaan that God has for you. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I'm going to get through all seven of these. Is this helpful? Is this helping? Number six, the grasshopper syndrome must be handled. The Israelites, the ten spies, they come back and they say this. They said this. Um, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and to them. You see, we've done this thing in church, and I, I, I wish we could do away with this. Here's what we do. What we do in church is that we have low self-esteem, but we call it humility. Because as long as you see yourself like a grasshopper, you are never going to take on a fight with a giant. And the issue is not the giant. The issue is how you see yourself because the giant of insecurity will take you out faster than the giant that you're afraid of. See, what we do is we battle with all these insecurities, but I love the prophetic song that we sang. I am who you say I am. I am the head and not the tail. I am above only and never beneath. I am more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I am who God says I am. And if God has said I'm a giant killer, then baby, why would I call myself a grasshopper. I am anointed. I am rich. I am wealthy. I am healed. I've got to believe what I need to believe about myself before I can ever kill a giant. 
And there are so many of us, we're frozen with insecurity. And here's what insecurity does. You can read it right there in Numbers chapter 13, that last verse, verse 33. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and to them. Because insecurity will assume how other people view you. And you'll start making statements about other people's opinions of you. See, they don't, they don't, they don't want me in a group of friends. How do you know? See, see insecure, that's insecurity. Confidence says, I'll find my own friends. You don't want me to be friends with you? I don't want to be friends with you neither. See, real confidence says, I don't care. I don't care because I am who God says I am. My friendship with you doesn't validate me. My friendship with you, I don't need you to put a stamp of approval on who I am. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I know exactly who I am. And you know what? Maybe God don't want me to be friends with you. Maybe your rejection is God protecting me from a friendship that's going to pull me down and keep me stuck in the wilderness. Why am I so sensitive towards everybody's rejection of me? I don't care what you think about me. Because if God is for me, you can't be against me. If God is for me, you can't stop me. If God is for me, I don't need your opinion. God did not vote me into office, and I don't need your vote to stay. I'm not an elected official. I'm anointed by God to be in this company. I'm anointed by God to be in this room. I'm anointed by God to be everything that God has called me to be. And as long as I have a grasshopper syndrome, I'm going to see myself as insignificant, and I'm going to assume that people see me that way as well. If we're going to take giants, we can't think about ourselves as grasshoppers. One of the biggest fears that I had getting married was I didn't see myself as a husband. Come on, that's real. Because my dad wasn't a good husband. and My grandfather wasn't a good husband. I hadn't seen good husbands. And so when you don't grow up seeing marriage modeled, it can make you think that you are something that you are not. And so I stood before my wife to get married, and I did it in faith. Because if God called me a husband, then you know what? I believe it. And if God called me to be a business owner, then you know what? I've got to believe it. And I may not feel like it, but I still believe it. And what would you do if you did believe it? Do that. How would you act if you did believe? Sometimes you got to fake it before you make it. Sometimes you got to realize, you know what? My, my mind will change when my actions change. And I'm going to walk this thing out in faith. Last one. I think we're at number seven. I think we're at number seven. Pastor Al, come on. We did it. Anybody? We heard Pastor Al sing today. <laughs> Jealousy arose in my heart. I was like, not only can Pastor Brian sing, now Pastor Al can sing. I'm the only pastor who can't sing on staff. It's okay. Number seven. Number seven. Giants are generational. I want us to throw up. 1 Samuel um, 17. I want us to throw up 1 Samuel 17. It says this. Uh, uh, I think it's 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. It says, a, cha a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp, and he was, his height was six cubits in a span. I, I got I to gotta help us because... The generation that believe the negative report, they die off in the wilderness. They never go into the land. Joshua's generation, they are able to go into the land. They go into Canaan. Joshua leads the people. Then you get into the book of Judges. And we have about six or seven generations through the book of Judges. And then we get into 1 Samuel and Saul is the king and we get into David. So between David, who's fighting Goliath, and the generation that was supposed to kill the giants, we have somewhere between eight to ten generations of people. And David is fighting a giant that his great, 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 great parents should have killed. And do you know that every giant you leave alive is a giant that your babies are going to have to deal with? See, the reason that it's so imperative that the enemy wants to attack you with fear is because he knows that giants are generational and they grow with every generation. So the giant is, the, I love that Goliath, it says how tall he is because the giants shouldn't have even been in the land. 
There should have been no giants because the first generation should have killed every giant. And right now, I don't know if this is for you, but if you're in this room and you are dealing with a giant right now that your grandparents did not kill or your great grandparents did not kill, I don't know who that is, but that's me, baby. My, my dad did not kill the giant of addiction, so I'm trying to kill it. Come on, we release a blessing over you. You may think it's not fair that you have to deal with giants because your parents didn't deal with it and your grandparents didn't deal with it, but I break the curse of the enemy. All of your life right now you will kill every giant in the land you will see victory in your family you will break generational strongholds if you're in this room and you're a woman and your mother wasn't married and your grandmother wasn't married come on I declare over your life that that cycle is over you will be the David that rises up and says Goliath will die if there's an anointing on you to kill giants then that means those giants may have been in your family for years but you cannot take the status of of a victim and say it's not fair that somebody else should have killed this thing you've got to take your rightful place and say that I must be a David generation oh I must be a generation that says although I although I inherited this issue I will end this issue although I inherited this in a, in a way that was not fair I will kill this giant it stops with me and it goes no further there are things that my children will never have to deal with and my grandchildren will never have to deal with because I will make sure that the buck stops with me poverty ends with me come on divorce ends with me come on a pornography addiction ends with me come on incarceration ends with me come on I will bear the brunt of my family and I will see generational breakthrough in the earth give God a shot of praise come on all over this place we break strongholds right now in Jesus' name. We declare that no weapon formed against us will prosper and every tongue that rises up against us will fall in defeat. I declare every giant that's been assigned to your life will be slayed, will die. We release a giant killing anointing over you and over your family. Your last name will be known as a last name that glorifies God. Come on, I take my place. He won't have my babies. If your teenager is in the room, you better lay hands on them right now. He will not have my children. He won't have my grandchildren. I will not be selfish in this thing. It's not just about me. The Bible says that a good man leaves wealth for his children's, children's, children. And see, this is why I said you got to think bigger. Because you've thought, I'm a good dad as long as I show up to basketball games. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm there. And the Bible's going to say, no, 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 no. It's not just about showing up. I've got to show up for a generation I'll never see. I want them to tell stories about me. Oh yeah, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, he bought this land. Yeah, he built this house. Oh yeah, yeah, the next, next, next generation of world overcomers needs to know, oh, there was a generation that tithed and gave to the work of the Lord and we built something that is established in the earth. I want generational inheritance. Even though I had to deal with a generational giant, I'm believing God for generational inheritance even though I've had to deal with a generational giant. If that's you, come on with your hands lifted all over this room. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Everybody in my family has dealt with addiction. And so, there are so many safeguards I have to put in my life to not deal with that. And my motivation isn't just, God, I want to be, I want to be free. My, gener my, my prayer is, no, 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 no. I'll take the bullet as long as my children can walk in freedom and my grandchildren can walk in freedom he didn't just save you to save you he saved you the book of Acts says he saved you in order to have access to everything coming after you and so God I release a prayer over your people right now God we release a prayer over your people God, what you're doing is so much bigger than what we've thought as and thought about it as. And so, God, I declare 
over every single person in this room. God, I declare over their life, they're not going to complain about the giant. All like David, they're going to say, you come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. I hear giants falling in the room. I hear giants falling in the room. All over the room, I hear the giants that have been in your family for generations. They're falling. They're falling. They're falling. This is a God that fights for you. He fights your battles for you. All you need to do is show up to the battlefield. And this is a God that says, as long as you show up I'll show off as long as you show up I'll show off God I pray I pray I pray over that mom who's over here in this section right now and she's believing you God right now for her daughters and for her sons God I ask that you would do immeasurably more than we can ask think or even imagine God we love you 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 Jesus we love you, Jesus. The Spirit of God is, the Spirit of the Lord is just in this room in a mighty way, in a mighty way. The Spirit of the Lord is in this room. If I had more time, I would lay hands on everybody in this room because I feel the anointing of God on this message. I feel the anointing of God on our church in this season. And we're going to take Canaan. Oh, come on. I need more people to believe that by faith. We are going to take Canaan. We're going to take Canaan. It is not by coincidence that you are in this church at this time. You will take Canaan. I don't know what your Canaan is, but you need to write down. What are my grapes? Come on. What are my grapes? This is homework after church. What are my grapes? What's the fruit of the land that I'm believing God for? What are my grapes? What are my giants? What are the things that have been in my family for years? What are, the, what are the giants that have been attacking my life and been attacking my marriage? What are my giants? Number two, number three, what are my grasshoppers? What are my insecurities? What are the internal giants that I'm fighting that are really keeping me from fighting the external giant that I need to be focused on? Let's pray, let's pray. God, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice right now, from the left to the right, to the front to the back, from the least to the greatest. God, I thank you, Lord God, that they are anointed. They're anointed to do everything that you've called them to do. They will not fail in the assignment on their life. I thank you that their life is not by coincidence. God, we declare Canaan is ours. In Jesus' name. As we leave this place, God, we declare that we're not leaving your presence. Oh, God. We ask that the word that you've sown today would go into our Monday, into our Tuesday, okay. into our Wednesday, and that it would bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. God, we don't just want to be hearers of your word. We want to be doers of your word as well. God, keep us safe as we leave this place. God, anoint our cars, anoint our vehicles. No accidents on the highways, God. Nothing, was, nothing is going to befall us this week. No weapon formed against us will prosper this week. God, we thank you for safety. Send your angels to encamp around all of our affairs. Like Job, put a hedge of protection around us this week, God. We're believing you for signs, miracles, and wonders. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said together. Come on, with authority, we all said together. Amen. World Overcomers. You are dismissed. We love you.